All righty. Well, it looks like we've got a bunch of new faces today. Um, so one of the things that as a visioning committee, the committee is assigned. So folks that have not been part of the committee, uh, the one thing that the reason that we do a committee is so that we're not revisiting four meetings ago. That's why we have everything posted. So if we could be respectful of the agenda at this point, um, get through that. And then if we've got questions along the way from four meetings ago, we can certainly try and address those as well. Okay. So why don't we go around the room real quick. Quick introductions. I see one of our new board members, Dr. Lindy Hartwells is here. We've got, looks like there's eight people online. So why don't we start over here and uh, go through introductions. Nancy Cantor, I've lived in Southern part of Scottsdale for 60 years, like more, and I've been involved with the schools for 37 years, been involved with the city for 37 years, so I'm working for this. Evan Richard, uh, neighbor of Tonalia. I have six kids still involved with the school because of six kids and have lived here since the early 80s. So it's a long time ago. Jose Velarde, I moved here in 79. Uh, I went to Coronado uh, and my kids all went to SUSD schools. Alyssa Nowacki, assistant principal here at Tonley K-8, proud to be representing tonight. Uh, Randy Clues, a uh, longtime resident of Scottsdale, went to Tonalia when they're still Tonalia. <laughs> <laughs> my dad taught at Tonalia as well. And uh, I'm a performance school. Hello, my name is Rochelle. Um, born and raised in this area, have good friends and family in this neighborhood, and I'm also a teacher in this area as well. Hi, I'm Monica Sampson. I am a proud alumni of Tonalia Elementary, and I teach 600 kids in this area a week. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, my name is Dan Troop. I'm I live around the corner from Tonalea on Vernon. I went to Tonalea and actually lived in the neighborhood most of my life, and so I'm quite interested in what's been going on here. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Ed Crawford. Uh, I'm a native, born and raised uh, in Scottsdale, Kiva Elementary, Swar High School, um, and a homeowner off of Wilshire uh, Drive off of 68th Street. So. I became aware of this through social media, and this was an opportunity to come and learn and listen and maybe provide some feedback for tonight's uh, discussion. Pleasure to be here. Hi, I'm Lisa Sampson, and uh, was the PTO president of Tonalia, and lived locally in the neighborhood, neighborhood watch captain, and just uh, really like to be involved in community. Hi, I'm Amber Sampson, um, born and raised here, Tonalia alum, and I'm the board president and director and founder of the Southwest Native Agricultural Center, which is the alternative proposal for the space. I'm Louise Lamb. I moved here in 1983, and I'm currently on the Neighborhood Advisory Commission. I'm Sonny Kirtley, 53-year resident of Scottsdale. I used to live in North Scottsdale. I'm a high Navajo school. That was North Scottsdale. Same <laughs> <laughs> road did not go through. Right. All my children went to Navajo and then on to Saguaro High. And I am the, on the board of directors for COGS, the Coalition of Greater Scottsdale, which is a citywide neighbor advocate group. I'm Renita Linyard. I've lived here since 1957. I went to Tonalia, went to Coronado, and I still live in the same house. And I'm Bob, I'm with her. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky man. Hi, I'm Old Hydrant. I grew up going to Tonalia and Coronado as well. I have left for a while, but I'm back in the house I grew up in. Nice. And I'm just coming to see what's going on. Uh, Libby Hartwells, I'm on the board for SUSD, and I live in a different learning community of SUSD. But, uh, happy to be here and hear what all of you have to contribute uh, to the conversation. Thanks for coming this evening. My name is Bobby Dooley. I'm the general manager of the Phoenix Rising Football Club. It's nice to see some familiar faces and look forward to hearing some feedback and some thoughts and ideas from 
from some of those that are, that are new this evening. My name is Tim Reister. I am one of the founding co-owners of Phoenix Rising FC and also served on the board of our uh, nonprofit youth organization. I moved to Scottsdale 36 years ago and am delighted to see so many of you back and, and to meet uh, those of you who are newly here and interested in the project. Thanks for having us back down. Okay. So uh, those of you that are online, um, like to introduce yourselves, uh, Doreen. Hi, I'm Doreen Song. I live just north of Old Tonalia. I'm a former P PTO president of uh, Old Supai and um, glad to be part of this group. Thanks, Doreen. Uh, Lorna? Hi everyone, this is Lauren. I'm a neighbor of Tonalia School. And um, Patty Beckman. Hi there, I'm Patty Beckman. I know most of you. I'm a board member for SUSD, um, longtime resident. My family's been here since the 50s. My mom went to Hobocom and my aunts all went through Coronado. So good to be here and hi. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Hi, can, can you hear me? Is this microphone working? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name's Rebecca Turley and I grew up in Scottsdale and I went to Tonalia for most of my elementary school. Awesome. Uh, Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Palacicci. I'm the proud principal of Coronado and I live in South Scottsdale. I'm actually on 68th Street, just about a mile or so north of the Tonalia property. Okay. Um, Jason. Jason. Muted. Okay. Um, Kelly. Hi, my name's Kelly Vaughn and, um, I've lived in this neighborhood. Well, actually I, I live in the house that my grandmother um purchased and she was the second owner in the early 60s so been here longer than i've been here okay jason second chance okay jason says in the chat skip him Tec technical difficulties okay boy won't we all be glad when this is over yes <laughs> okay so today's agenda was for us to just quickly review everyone that is on our mailing list uh, should have gotten the questions responses that Phoenix Rising provided did anyone not get those that needs a copy I only brought 10 copies uh, it can't blame me it was Alice's fault she's a smart one Keep in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think Bob had a question right off the bat. Um, Bob, did you want to ask your question about the lighting? Yeah. The, uh, light. So last, last week you guys said we're going to be four light standards put up there. But on this piece of paper with the question, it refers to six. So is there two middle lights for sure? Is that? Ago. Our our hope is we can do it with four, but we put six because if we get in four and there's not enough light in the middle, I'd rather have you know up front that there could be as many as six, but we're hoping to do it with four. We budgeted four. Yeah, and the two middle ones will be on the inside of the field. Exactly. In the middle and like exactly. the 50 yard line. They would just be it down in the center of the bed. <laughs> yeah, because there's a there's a gap between the two fields where yeah. the parents can sit. Yes. And so we, we need to be able to shine light down there. The lighting company is saying they believe we can do it with just four poles. Yeah. Because the lighting's so much better than it used to be. Yeah. And it's so directional. Yeah. But just to be safe, we didn't want to put four in writing and then find out that it didn't work and then have you guys feel that we weren't uh, honest with you. So we, we put in six, but our hope is to do it with four. How many fixtures for both? Oh, boy, I don't know that. That's a good question. Yeah, so. And these are these are supposedly lights that are for the practice field, not for game time. Correct, correct. They're for LED lights. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, we went out to that written house. Oh, good. Good. And they, they are very directional and they, and they don't have a lot of spillover. It's difficult to tell because it's, a, it's such a huge complex. Yeah. And the parking lot lights everywhere. But we went around on the back side where there's a big gap between the complex and some homes. And it was dark. Oh, and it was dark. Yeah. yeah. But it was hard to gauge the distance from where we sit at Tamalia versus where the lights are actually going to be. On the, Thank you for doing it. We really yeah. appreciate it. There wasn't that. I mean, the spillover wasn't horrible at all. I mean, we, we've been so surprised with how advanced these new lighting systems are. Yeah. They are in our stadium. You can come up on a game night and it looks like it's not even open uh -huh. until you get right underneath those lights because well, those, not those, those, those are those are the TV. The lighting vendor that you use is good too. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you guys are planning on using Moscow, right? And not call light. Must go. Okay, good to know. So, can you guys the the name of the park? So, if people want to do a little road trip, they, that they're able to do so. Uh, I don't know that we can get a, a bus to take everybody out there, but if people want to go see it, like like Bob and Renita did, what's the location again? That's right now. Park is it has those lights. We also have them at our new stadium, um, but those those wouldn't be good representation because they're broadcast quality, um, and they put out over um, way too much. Uh, Where is Rittenhouse Park? Uh, I have to. I, well, I'll be doing that. I'll send you the exact direction. Yeah, so you can distribute to the group. I'll look it up and, and get you guys that information. Tower and Rittenhouse. And the lady there said that they had just changed the name from Rittenhouse Park to something else because they had just built a big shopping area across the street. So it was, I don't remember the name, Desert Something. So they had called it Desert Something Park. But it was out there. Very nice. Thank you. We'll look it up and make sure that everyone gets that information. So if you want to take a little road trip, um, I know that one of the one of the questions was also the noise, the, the, the volume of a game day. And I would recommend anybody go to any of the soccer fields around town. Uh, Cat Basin, uh, Scottsdale over there off of Princess, uh, they've constantly got soccer games going on um, to get some sense of, of what it sounds like during a soccer game. It's not like a football stadium level soccer game or, or football game. Um, a lot of soccer moms cheering for their kids, but it's not just this massive booming sound that comes out of those games. Any Saturday right now, you can probably find a tournament and see what that traffic looks like. Uh, Reach 11 is right off the 101 off of Deer Valley. They got 20 some fields there. They got they host hundreds and hundreds of teams on a weekend basis. Um, so I, I encourage you to to go look at that to see if if that's something that that might concern you okay those are two locations that i would definitely recommend doing um it's been a few years since i've been doing soccer i, I don't think um uh, reach 11 is the high quality musco lighting that rising is proposing uh, so it does tend to have more spill um, but the, this right now so i've heard good things about it so um, and that's the light the best hours to see the light. What day is the week of best hours I would see the light? Well, they're, they're operating every evening for practices. Okay. okay. Um, so I think pretty much any Saturday. weekday evening you can Weekday, um, maybe on Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, like the Saturdays and Sundays often games stop. You know, they end before dinner. Yeah. Uh, unless there's a tournament or something. But usually the games are during the daytime. Um, so I think a, a weekday evening when kids are just practicing, that would be yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, more questions. Stop the questions. Questions about the questions. Yeah. Yes, I have a question about the question. So the fencing plan seems different on paper than it was presented on our team, and I was wondering. I'm going to take a second, but could you please describe your actual plan, including neighborhood and playground access for the fencing? Yeah. Um, the architecture firm said that they have to work directly with the city of Scottsdale to adhere to whatever the latest and newest fencing requirements are. What our desire is, is to have a perimeter fence 
that protect and prevent any children from being able to, to step out onto the street, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that the property's fenced in now, we want to keep that kind of exterior fence. We don't know if the city will allow us to keep the fence that's there. It's in nice condition. And I like that you can see through because that it's going to be beautiful in there when we're done. And I think it adds to the community if they'll let us leave it like that. They may say that for some reason that fence is no longer valid because they can have a map and put a new one. You'll see in our budget, we budgeted for an entirely new fence, um, but we're hoping maybe that, that they'll allow us to, to keep that perimeter fence. We want to have some access points though, so the neighbors can get in and use the exercise path and the exercise station that'll be inside that outer fence, and, but separated from the field. So there's an outer fence and then there's a fence inside of the exercise path that separates the field from that path. So, and that way, if somebody's walking with their dog and kids happen to be practicing and a dog gets loose, it's not running out onto the field and the kid gets hurt or the dog gets kicked or you know, something like that. So that's why there'll be an inner fence separating from the exercise path. The other thing that allows us to do is when we're completed, we can lock access to those fields and protect those so we don't end up with somebody goes in at night in a car and wants to you know rip it all apart or something we can protect it lock it but still leave access to the playground and that exercise path for the community so that will be lit with smaller light not the big field lights but just smaller lighting half lights and so will that playground so you guys can come in with your kids and grandkids and access that at any time and then we'll only open and close the inner fields either for our events or if you schedule to use the fields for a wedding or a birthday or something at a time that works with our schedule, we'll have someone there to unlock it and give you access. So to clarify, you'll have two fields, one, I'm speaking two fences, one outside, one inside, and there will be access to the community 24-7, the playground and the exterior. Exactly correct. Okay. That's right. Uh, sure. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Um, the discussion. So part of my part of my reason being here is, of course, um, congestion, traffic, parking. Um, is there? And I was just new to this, so I'm following. Is there a specific number of parking? It's already been outlined. It's somewhere I can see online that yeah. I haven't looked at yet. Um, do we? I mean, I think there's a lot of concern about over low people parking on mm -hmm. residential streets so and that's how many spaces so there are I can't remember how many spaces in total body are there about 80 to 100 in the north yeah here and then there are more than that yeah. i can check on here for you 54. there's 54 not there's 54, 54 parking spaces, spaces on the north side, side. <laughs> north side. <laughs> north side. <laughs> how many yeah. 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 kids do you actually are my the practice it could be three or four more, but it's in the 50s, not the 100s. And the 50s, and this is the north side here? That's correct. This and then the south side, do we know what that number is? Yeah. You know what it says on I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't know if I can read it myself. It's so dark. I can pull it up on my laptop. Again, I, <laughs> one of the things that the Wilson Park Authority will have to do is to look at the location of the fence that they will have to do. As far as traffic is concerned, is they're going to have to go through a traffic study. Right. Once, once they get to the point where they're they're actually moving forward with the lease and they get to design they'll have to go through a traffic study and and one of the items on our agenda tonight is to talk about practices and games and how many kids how many families right. would be associated with those games at what interval every hour every 90 minutes whatever the case may be rising should have that information as part of, of today's agenda so May I interrupt just for a second? Yep. I have an exact answer for you now. Um, there will be 100 spaces. And that's what's currently in the plan for parking. Part of that is this northern area has parking that we're removing for the safety of the kids in front of the existing building. So there'll be 50 spaces remaining on the north side, and we're adding 50 new spaces on the south side. So there'll be space for 100 cars within the actual complex. 
Sorry to interrupt you. Now. I just want no to. No problem. Thank you. Can you see that area we're moving? Here, I'll show you. Oh, it's the handicap. In the corner. In front of the guy. We'll see where this building is. Yeah. We're just the right in the north last right. corner. We're trying to keep cars away because kids might go to the potty and sure. stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Nancy. There's a lot of people who are worried about cars parking in the neighborhood, and I understand that completely. Uh, it leads to a lot of complexity. Um, I was talking with the city manager the other day, and it is possible for the city to come in and put the signage up that there's no parking in the neighborhood. And the people who live there would have, they'd be fine, but they got you from outside. This is what they've done in the area around the, the downtown where they've had people who. And what baseball stadium? Yeah. The ASU did that too. Yeah. It's like third and fourth street issue. You may have any sign marks. So that. As many signs as you want, but you also see court. That, that's so a couple of things. It can be a double edged sword um, because we have seen it uh, not in Scottsdale, but in Phoenix, where they put the signs up. It's actually in the uh, Arcadia at Arcadia High School. There's a neighborhood nestled right there by Arcadia High School. And um, in the city of Phoenix, they put the signs up, then no one parks there. And so the residents themselves are, are you know, hurt by that. Um, different cities, but uh, the other thing is, is that we can put a thousand signs up. Unless there's enforcement by Scottsdale, People ignore signs. People ignore signs all day, every day. We see it at our schools all the time. So uh, one of the things that, that I hope to get across to everyone is even if this group says, yeah, let's press forward, let's go to the board, let's get the board to approve it. Phoenix Rising still has a lot of work to do. They, they have to go through the city, go through planning, Go through all the things, talk about uh, stormwater management, talk about traffic, talk about all those things. So it's not like just because we say, yeah, go ahead, that it's a done deal, that, that it's just going to magically appear. Um, the, the designers have to work with city planners. They've got ordinances that they have to deal with. They've got a lot of work to do. So it's not that they can ignore any of it um, because even though they're on our property, um, they're a private entity. So they're going to have some hoops to jump through to make sure uh, that they satisfy the city and, and all of their requirements. Yes, sir. Um, how, many, how many people are in attendance on typical game? So let, let's get to that in just a little bit because okay. that is one of our agenda items, okay? Yes. I appreciate what you just said about going, and I'm hoping for a little clarification. Um, I love that we're having this meet, meeting right now with Phoenix Rising, but I'm wondering if we're having this meeting because we as a community have decided to move forward on that idea, or if there's still a conversation that can take place about what needs to happen in the space. And if that's possible, is there any way the community can actually meet as a community without a third party entity to talk about their goals and maybe possible other proposals for the space so at this point my instructions are that we're pursuing the proposal from phoenix rice is there a reason behind that um because that's what i was told to do okay that is not the decider so yeah i'm not at the the ultimate authority rising has been talking to the district for many many months actually two years 2019, December 2019, was the beginning of the discussion. So we're walking down this path. And we had the community just absolutely say, no way, Jose, we do not want this thing to go forward. Well, then we would have to look in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we're looking for the best possible opportunity for that facility. Something that will be fully developed, that, that they're going to fully maintain the district won't have any financial commitment to that property um it's a 20-year commitment from them so we're pursuing that okay um if there was uh, some pickup some stall some 
other direction that I got, well, then there would be a different conversation. But as of today, and this visioning committee was developed for the purpose of walking through that proposal. It wasn't to have a uh, this proposal versus that proposal. It was the committee to decide if this proposal is a valid proposal and something that we could live with and want to go forward with. Okay, that's the purpose of this meeting. If we wanted to open up another conversation, we're going to have a group over here saying we want this, and a group over here saying we want this, and another group over here saying we want that. And we'll never get anywhere. This has been a long, a long, long time waiting for something to happen. And they came to us in December of 19 for us to start moving forward. It stalled because of COVID. It's been regenerated. So unless I get direction otherwise, at this point, this is the proposal that's being considered. Yes. I can appreciate the longevity of the process and how frustrating that might be for Phoenix Rising. But having sat in the meeting December 10th and listened to how the district was open to any other proposals and they hadn't received any other proposals. And to the best of my knowledge, the other proposal for Southwest Native Agricultural Center was being emailed before the December 10th meeting. And it's a very viable proposal. So what you're if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, you're saying no matter what, even if the that in December you were saying you were interested in other proposals, that at the present moment we're just going to assess out whether we want the one or not. At the present moment, my direction has been work through the Phoenix Rising proposal. Could That's you, been my instruction. Sorry. Could you give us a timeline of where that might be for the community? Would it be three meetings and then a vote? Would you send a mailer out to the community to get their opinion? Because right now I only see what, like 20 people? There's at least 10,000 people in a zip code sometimes. I'd love to have that many people giving just a check on a box or knowing about something in the community that would be kind of nice because then it would feel like a, a reflection of the community and not just a reflection of the 20 people who are here. Sure, sure. So I'm hopeful that this will be our last meeting of this vision committee for the purpose of next step going to the community as a whole. Doing mail, getting everybody to, hey, we're going to have a conversation. Now, oftentimes, even a mailer, we put it on Twitter, we put it on Facebook, we put it everywhere we, we can put it. And then two weeks after the event, people say, oh, I didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So we send the mailers, we'll send out all the information we can. The information is all on the website. Right Every bit of information that we've had about this particular process is on our district website right now. So anyone can go look at the proposal, look at the, the renderings, look at all of that stuff and uh, meeting minutes and all of that to see what it is that's been talked about. Uh, the last meeting, my tech guy videotaped the whole meeting. Uh, it's online. So. I would like to bring this to a head so we know we're moving forward. Rising would like to get it to the point that are we in or are we out? And I'm sure you that, that are uh, uh, part of the SNAP proposal would also like to know, are we in or are we out? Are we, uh, is this a waste of our time? Are we, you know, so I, I respect the fact that you guys have a proposal. The fact of the matter is we march down this path with Phoenix Rising and we're going to see it to its end, whatever that might be. And then if there's something else, we'll consider that. Okay. So, um, any other questions about Dennis? this? Yes. Dennis, we have a question in the chat and then someone online has their hand raised. Okay. The first question is, will we be able to review and comment during the COS design review process? Yes, the visioning committee. So let me tell you about the visioning committee process. Since there are a lot of new people, the visioning committee is uh, something that we started after the Hopi and Pima debacles. Okay, Hopi and Pima 
the construction started, design happened, neighborhoods were absolutely furious with us. And so after the administration changed over, they said, Dennis, we need to do something where we get the community's input. So we put together a visioning committee. The visioning committee had a project, Cherokee Elementary School. There wasn't a debate about the project. It was what we were doing with that project. So we would go through the process with the architects, the contractor, the uh, teachers, parents, community members that had nothing to do with students in the school. And we would go through this process of, of building that project and understanding what that project meant. Down to the last details of how big the windows were and what color paint was going on the building and all of that. Okay? This is a little bit different process, but we're going to kind of follow that same outline. We want the community to buy in to this, this program, this proposal. So they're paying for it, they're footing the bill, but it's on our property. So we're going to have a little say in it. Now, I don't think anyone in this room is an expert on field lighting, but they'll have their designer, their um, uh, supplier, provide that information and, and be able to look at that information. So yes, there will be a, a period of time once we're all in that we have meetings with the designer to say, yeah, okay, great, that's awesome. Uh, what about this? It's like one of the things that's come up multiple times is a drop off. You know, do we have a little loop in there to drop off or do we keep the bus lane in the front to keep that as a drop off? So that's one of those design elements that as the community saying, hey, keep everybody off our streets, then we need to make sure that they're looking at that. So that would be part of that community engagement during the design process, okay? Does that answer your question online? Yes, thank you, Dennis. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and Rebecca, you've got your hand up. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can. I'm wondering um, if the city has no financial incentive to to go with this Phoenix Phoenix Rising's proposal. Um, then why is some mysterious authority above you so determined to have this specific conversation, despite members of the community wanting to discuss a different proposal? Um, so there's no mysterious authority. Um, there is a district attorney that works for us that has been working on the lease. There is our, our superintendent um, that has uh, had many conversations with me about uh, looking at this proposal. Uh, there is our governing board that was uh, provided legal um, advice um, on, on what to do. And um, to my knowledge, and if I'm speaking out of turn, uh, Dr. Hart Wells, um, it was decided that they would uh, look deeper into this uh, lease agreement with Phoenix Rising. Is that fairly? But accurate? you can't disclose that reason to us right now. Well, the the, <laughs> the reason is that that they've been working on this this proposal for quite some time. So, like a sunk cost fallacy. Huh? What? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Um, like when you say you've invested so much time into something that it's better to just go with that, even though it might be better to end now, even though you've invested time in it. Well, I, I, I don't, um, you know, my personal opinion, I don't think matters a whole lot, but the proposal is a valid proposal. Uh, they're they're um, looking to invest nearly four and a half million dollars into the property. Um, it'll be good for the community. Uh, they're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the things that they're going to do with our students, with our Scottsdale students, and how they will benefit from that. Uh, the fact that there will be a uh, exercise track. Um, a playground, things that people have been asking for for years. Um, they've checked every box of the things that 
that we've been hearing for years. So uh, there's, it, it, in our minds, as the district, there's no downside um, to this proposal as long as they meet the, the requests that have been made by the community. Okay, thanks for answering my questions. Okay. Dennis, one more question in the chat. Yep. Um, and can we see a list of other proposals? There, to my knowledge, there's only one other proposal. And yes, we can get that uh, out. So if you can um, type your email contact in the chat, we'll uh, get that out to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Question to the question. <laughs> Any more? Yes, Amber. I have three. So my first question is basically, if you don't have time to answer these, who's the right person to send them to? So Phoenix Rising can send an answer like they did last time. This is very helpful. Okay. For actual yep. Would I send it to you? Would I send it to Alice? Um, I send yeah, it to send it to Alice. Okay. Alice is the gatekeeper. And I will, I'll pick just one. Um, so how will access to the community reading meeting room function when you're not at the site? Because I respect the fact that you want to lock up your property when you're not there, but you also secondarily promised that you would have access to the community meeting room. So how are you going to have that function if you're locking the space and also providing access? Do you have a plan for that if the community can have access? Yeah, so, so during business hours, we will have an administrator on site um, who can provide access to anybody. And in fact, we'll just keep it unlocked at that time, but we'll have supervision there. So when kids are there, one thing they have to be very careful of as a youth a managed charitable organization is providing supervision so kids are never left alone with an individual. And we have to be careful about neighbors being your kids who were respected because it's our insurance that's covering the kids and it's very important we protect the kids at all times. So people can come and use those bathrooms but we'll make sure there's always supervision on site for that. When we leave and lock the facility and that outer exercise path is open, that building with the restrooms will be closed because it's not a public park. So it's not like uh, if you're at Chaparral Park and the bathroom stays open, no or that'll be closed. No. But when the neighbors want to use it after hours, they, they will use the bring their that chest of water. Designated administrator at Rising and actually schedule the use. And what we talked about at the last meeting is we'll use a, a Google Gmail calendar that can be shared with the community where people can go online and see, is that facility available at the time I'd like to have it for my birthday party or anniversary celebration, whatever, or community meeting. And if you see it's already booked by somebody, you can say, oh, but it's, it's open the next day at this time. And you can go in and book it right then. And, and go in and actually book the room in there, and that notifies our administrator. And it's just like in a business, you know, when you have all your conference rooms uh, listed in there, we're going to run it the same way. That way, you guys all have fair access to it and, and can go use that. Um, we'll provide the cleaning costs to the restrooms in that room. The only thing we'll ask is if you guys come in and really have a rager in there that you can kind of clean up for the signature before you leave. Yeah, our neighborhood is known for that rager. Yeah, right? Um, so to clarify, you have eight thirty to nine thirty. So would you have someone like a phone hand because someone might want to come in at noon and have a community knitting club or whatever it is? Exactly right. So if prior to the time where we start practicing with the kids on weekdays during phase one. We would not have a person on site unless they need to come over and allow community members into that facility. On the weekends, of course, we'd be there all day because there are games throughout the day on the weekend. Once phase two is completed, and that's where, so phase two is, is the office building that we want to put on the site, and that will be the headquarters for our administrative staff for the entire youth program. Once they're there, you will have staff on site weekdays from 8 in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. You know because of the, the practices so but we're breaking that into phase one and phase two because if we wait until that building's completed to provide the neighbors and kids access to the site it'll lock that site up into construction for the two years versus if we just focus on getting the field the exercise path 
the existing building remodel, the extra parking on it, we can generate much more quick use and enjoyment and beauty for the site. That's why we broke it into two components. It's the second component. That's, that's, that building. Building. that's correct. That's all that is in the, in the uh, second page. Does anyone not have the financial breakdown? I know I, I put enough on the table. Anyone need it? Okay. Um, so let's uh, last try on the question. I want to give everyone the opportunity. Okay. So, Tim. Can you just uh, quickly review that financial because we're planning on doing to the facility? Absolutely, Dennis, and if it's okay, I'd like our general manager, Bobby Dooley. Absolutely. Share with the group. Bobby has helped build out two different complexes for us to date. So he's very familiar with the vendors. And if you ask questions, I'll refer to Bobby anyway. So I'd rather give him the authority to go through with that. Okay. Hey, Bobby, any chance you'd come up here so you're just closer to the speaker for those that are uh, here. Thank you. <laughs> so, as your outside voice, I will, I will. I won't take my mask on, but I can't. Um, so, as Tim mentioned, um, the first phase is going to be what's important for us right away to get it going and to beautify the site and, and utilize it would be the two soccer fields, the playground, um, the walking path, and to refurbish, remodel, and, and maintain that existing wall. We understand that's very important but also um, um, the, the community room and the bathrooms in, uh, in that building. So two fields. Um, these fields are, are high quality. Um, the irrigation that we put in these fields, the drainage to the sand. fields. And we'll have two full size fields there. Um, but I called Dennis. I let him know that we lost him. He's working on getting us reconnected. Thank you guys for your patience. I feel like an EDL student tonight. Well, at least then you can have that perspective.
there. Your uh, your input would be be uh, very much appreciated. Annual maintenance. Uh, I want to stress. Obviously, Dennis has brought this up a few different times. On you know, we would have to pay for this. Um, you know, pay a rent to the city. We're looking at at 20, 20 years right now on on an agreement. And so just this annual maintenance cost of roughly hundred thousand dollars doesn't include any of the, the youth staff or, or anyone like that, but that would be someone to maintain the fields. It's very important to maintain the fields and that includes the overseeding and whatnot to make sure that um, we can utilize these and we get a long life out of that. Cleaning of the buildings, as Tim mentioned, that would be our responsibility, even if you guys utilize that space. Security, I know that was a question that came up on security and we've, we've operated two different facilities now and we've seen a few different ways to do that, but essentially we would use a third party as part of the, uh, as part of their kind of rotation, they would uh, you know have a set businesses that they go to each and every night. They would stop by, so we would not have someone on site at all times. We would lock the bathrooms in the community building at night when we left there. We would lock the fences, and uh, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have someone on the on the site 24/7 from a security standpoint. Um, obviously, you know trash maintenance. Um, you know, one thing, Tim, I'm thinking about it just because we just had to put one on our left side is, you know, I, I'm not sure dumpsters where that would go and trash pickup. It's um, it's sometimes something forgotten until you get too far in the project. So um, I know it's important because we want to make sure. And I think Tim brought this up in a couple of our previous meetings that our clubs, our youth players, our coaches, they're they uh, we, we stress to them the importance of because we're at different parks all over all over the valley, all of the state. To make sure that we leave the spot better than it was before, but we certainly need trash cans and then, of course, dumpsters. Um, so I would have to figure that out um, where that would be on there. So, um, and then, of course, utilities, um, water bills, electric bills, um, that would be part of the ongoing. And then phase two, um, we would look at that building. You know, we've talked about a 10,000 square foot building to house our, our uh, youth administrative staff, to have some locker rooms for the kids to come in and out of, to have maybe a fitness room, a medical um, component as well uh, for our kids and, and uh, anyone else that would potentially utilize that building. But that would be part of phase two of the project. Maintenance, do you have like a maintenance building on, on your other site? So are you going to bring in crews that with mowers and everything? We brought in a third party um, at both sites. Um, they haven't been an in-house. Um, we don't have in-house staff even with the first team right now. So we have a third party that we contract out with. Um, We've done things such as shipping containers where they've left some things on site with other things that we have the store, but um, typically similar to what you see in HOAs um, and, and different community parks as well. They'll come in, they'll bring their trailer, they'll park in the parking lot and probably in the morning time when it's not in use, they'll mow the fields. Um, but there's certainly, if, if we're fortunate enough, these are, these are fields that we wanna get in Scottsdale, but we also are, also are striving to have these types of complexes in other parts of the valley and are looking for opportunities as well um at some point perhaps we have a house you know um field maintenance crew for those of you that are familiar with the property there's two large block walls one encloses the uh wireless antenna and its equipment and the other used to be where the trash receptacles were and they kept any of the uh, facility equipment there. So Rising may look at that and say, hey, there's a slab of concrete, there's an enclosure, we just need to finish it up and we can keep our stuff there. So, you know, again, once we get through that design or start through that design process, then they can look at those amenities and say, oh, well, this is already existing. We don't need to fool with that. And I know we're amenable like it. I like that idea. Get that little wall up. So, um, and then we've got, um, there's walls along the parking lot that are, are used for when cars are parking that their lights aren't shining into the neighborhood. So those walls would likely have to stay as well. Yeah, and we'll have to store without the, the second phase there and that which would include some storage. We would have to figure out a way to store some of the nets or the balls or the, the small bowls that we bring out and cones and things that are utilized on a nightly basis. So we're not hauling stuff back and forth, but um, that was a good question. Bobby, I'm confused about something. So in phase one, is the only bathroom on the property that everyone has access to in the community room? Yeah, there'll be bathrooms, men's and women's bathrooms, as well as a community room in that building. And there's some existing infrastructure in place right there, of course, that we can 
so we're, we're confident. Um, of course, you never know the devils in the details as you get into the site and, and, and look through everything if everything's usable. But the plan is, is to have a community room as well as bathrooms for both men and women um, in, that, in that same building. So then in phase two, would you build additional bathrooms? Because I'm concerned yes. about the overlap of having a group in the community room and also having students coming in and using the same shared bathroom just like yes that. they're they're in the second building there will certainly be facilities um for for use and that would uh but but the community benefits because it opens up some more space on a regular basis on uh with the community room once phase two is completed Go ahead. and you're still planning on keeping the art Right. Absolutely, that's a must. We know we win from a couple of meetings before. We certainly know what the uh, the uh, the deal breakers are, and that's that's something that we want to incorporate for sure. She buys. She wrote the grant funding that. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. We have uh, a mosaic artist from the University of Arizona coming up, who will be making the repairs to it. Dennis did yeoman service in protecting that when they were demolishing the rest of the school. Um, we also have. Um, couple of plaques that we're working on, um, the one that will go with the mosaic, and then there's one that will go with the building. Who's we? We? Evan, he lives in the neighborhood. Jose is a neighborhood person. I'm a neighborhood person, and we've been working with the city, on, or the, city the school district on this for seven years. Wow. The plaques? The whole thing. We asked them to preserve the mosaic and they came in and built a wooden box around it when the school was being demolished so that it would be preserved. Thank you. Know. And we have been doing, I wish I knew who was, who was the artist in residence? You know. Who was the artist in residence for the front? No. Was the flat or the mosaic? The mosaic. The mosaic was an art teacher named Mr. C. Um, C stands for like some long Name. I can't <laughs> um, if you happen to think of it at some point, oh wow, it would be great to have him. Yeah, or at least to be able to. Yeah, and the plot actually made reference to that. I hope so. Fancy the district would have that information. They well, I've asked, and the one who had it originally was Janet Blum, and nobody knows where to find it at this point. The archives of the teachers they've employed. Uh, I uh, when I know the perfect person to dig that up. Okay, good. Cool. Because okay. so. they should have a picture of the original plaque. Uh -huh. We've got the plaque. We rescued it. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, Jimmy had it before he passed away with tour property, and uh, he went over one day, and the plaque was had been loosened up, uh -huh. and they were trying to tear it off. And uh, he went home, got the tools, went back on his motor scooter uh -huh. thingy, and uh, took it off and he gave it to Dennis. Oh, so they uh -huh. have the original plaque. Yes, we do. Oh, good. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Thank you for doing that. No. Okay. So, did you get it all out? I did. Okay. So, questions as far as that uh, that financial investment that they're looking to make as part of this proposal. Um, what about timing? So let's pretend for a minute that this was to go to the governing board in May. We have a community meeting, people are all for it. We go to a governing board meeting in May. Governing board says, yes, let's do this thing. Let's get this lease signed. What kind of timeline are we looking at for design, development, phase one, phase two, and so on and so forth? So I would say just because there's some variables there that we can't control, right? With some of the utilities and some unknowns if we grade the land and something happens. But let's just call it, it's ready to, to plug and play. I'm, I'm using that because we've brought, we just did this again at our, where we just built a new site at Wild Horse Pass down in at Gila River Indian Community. So assuming that everything's ready, right? We could plug in the, the building, right? If we remodel the building, you could plug it in. The water is ready to hook up the irrigation for the fields. Um, assuming that was already, I would say that we can we can build soccer fields um, in 60 days. Um, that thing to get done very quickly, right? Fencing goes up very quickly. Um, permitting um, designs of soccer fields. I, I mean, 
I would say less than three or four months, we could have everything um, ready to rock and roll. I would be very confident in, in that timeline. Phase one. And that's phase one. What are your requirements for the City of Scottsdale for going through DRB Development Review Board, Planning Commission, and City Council? Yeah, the, that, that would be, that, those are the variables that I'm talking about with permitting and approval process. If we had all of that ready to go, I would say once we had the green light from that, then the group that could build the fields, the group that would put the lights in, um, they can move very quickly. So I, don't, I couldn't answer, that would be a, I, I wouldn't know the answer so, to that process. That didn't answer my question. So this is um, a little bit uncharted water for me uh, in that as a school district, uh, we don't have to go through the DRB process, okay. but they're a private entity building on our property. So we're gonna have to have that conversation with the city um, as to what their requirements may be. Now, DRB is usually a three to six month process. So if we were to get a green light in May, then that DRB process could drag us into next Christmas. So um, it'll be a conversation that we have to have with the city as to whether or not they'll forego that because it's our property or not. Um, the big thing is we need to get that that last community meeting bill or that the community meeting the next one is the community ready for this process or are they going to be divided and say no we want this one we want this one and we stall if the if your school district gets their ducks in a row and go to a drb you could be on the consent agenda so it's how much preparation are you prepared to do working with the DRB right. and that can be done in you know before August but the council is out in August they take their break As and the planning that. commission may not even have to see you again you can look at consent agenda which is one and done yep. unlike the back seat yep. um, but and I don't think DRB you want your fields ready to go for fall so our so we roll over and our youth season typically starts we try out at the end of end of April actually as we start doing tryouts in early May and then there's a break and a little bit of a lull for for most of the kids the competitive and rec kids some of the elite teams train a little bit more uh, but come you know late July and early August is when the season would start back up so we're in such a need of fields that we're we're not going to be I would say pick we're managing right now um, so I'm not the the easy answer would be sooner than later <laughs> but um, we certainly understand there's some processes that we would have to go through approvals and um, we would have to work. Those are the unknowns that I'm talking about. But my timeline that I was referencing, just to be clear, and I apologize, is once permits, approvals, we have everything that we need and the site is ready for us. Um, and I know that could take a lot longer or shorter depending on where you're at. Um, that once we have that time frame down, we, are, we could build this very quickly. If uh, Dennis gets one city staff member to be assigned to him to shepherd and shepherd him through the process it goes much faster you know well i've already got a relationship with meredith tessier over there she's part of the DOD program yeah. Yeah, she's new. and so uh we've worked with her on a couple of other things Good. so the the thing is that, that uncharted part is typically we send them a letter saying we are not participating in the drb process as a school district we don't need to so we will find that path and find it quickly i totally get what you're talking about ducks in a row having the plans doing all of that the key to all of that though is to get this group into the community group and then to the board to say we're moving forward because i think they've got a line item in there for design yeah. Uh, and that's a lot of money to spend without a green light from the district. So we need to get that green light uh, before they're going to start designing. And that design process is that conversation with DRB, right? So um, we, we know the process. We don't usually follow it all the way through because we don't have to. Okay. So we will we will get that figured out. And then the two-story, 
That's a couple years. Yeah, I was in a couple year. years down, okay. down the road. So I think there was talk last time about um, there being this trial period. So their initial investment, if they're good neighbors, then things continue to move forward. If they're horrible neighbors and they're not doing what they promised, then there's a different discussion about what happens. Did I recall that correctly? And so that phase two of that development would, would be contingent on everybody's happy, the program's going well, the exercise uh, path is fantastic, everybody's thrilled with the program, and then you start that process. Design, for our school, the design takes about 12 months to get all the way through the process with engineers and all the consultants and all of that. So this is just a 20,000 square foot building. You know, maybe it's six months worth of design, depending on their team, depending on the input that we're getting. So there, there's a lot of variables there as far as designing the building and then building it. 20,000 square feet. We're going to build Kiva in about 14 months, and that's about 72,000 square feet. So, um, you know, it can happen fast or it can uh, be a long drawn out process. But I think the important part is phase one, that, that to have the fields, to have it maintained, to have the walking path, to have the playground, to have that community room with the bathrooms. I think that's key because that's where the community, this community will, will enjoy that versus the two story building that you really won't use. That's that's going to be for the club. Yes, sir. No, I'm just I'm, not, I'm sorry. I took a, like I was raising my hand. I'm not. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that? Because we do have uh, the, the next two things. Uh, because there's been a lot of concern about traffic, uh, we asked Rising to present their what their typical uh, weeknight practice might look like. How many kids? How many teams? How many of eaches? So that we can better understand that. Um, and then also on the weekends with their games. Now, I think there was a little bit of confusion last time um, about the tournaments. Two tournaments a year, right, is what you guys host for uh, for Rising, right? We currently host one. Oh, one. And our desire is to add a second one. Okay. So we put in the plan that there would be two tournaments a year. And, and the location isn't the headquarters for the tournament. It would simply function as two fields among, you know, 80 that we right. use during the tournament. So um, our, our tournament that we host now, uh, which occurs at the end of February, uh, we host 650 teams from Canada, Mexico, all across the United States. We've got teams in it from England. Uh, kids from all over the world come together and, and celebrate soccer here together. And, and the opportunity to have two more fields participating in that would be uh, very, very beneficial to the kids. Okay. Tim, are you yeah. saying 650 teams divided by 80 fields? Six, yeah, 600, 650 teams come together. Divided yeah. by 80 current available fields. Yeah, well, it, it could, you know, it's a lot of fields. Like we could, Chris Brown, who wasn't able to be here, could tell you exactly, he runs that tournament for us. But he had to guesstimate. Yeah, they're playing all over the ballot. They're playing all over the ballot. Two yeah. tournaments a year, one tournament, you might be expecting approximately a turnout of how many people. Oh, and that, that this is a location that would be no different than we would just like utilize games. this, but teams would play games at these fields, these two fields. But not all 650 um, teams would be playing at this location. So that makes we, sense. You know, when we have a tournament, we rent all of Reach 11, which has 22 fields. We, we rent all of Cap Basin, which is Scottsdale Sports Complex. We rent fields at Quail Run and Mesa hey. and in yes. Cham, all over yeah. the place. To try to accommodate that many visiting teams from around the around the country and around the world. Yeah. So you would have two fields in your neighborhood that are hosting those games. The difference is instead of them being local games during a tournament weekend, at the same time we normally do local games, these would be tournament games where people could be, you know, there could be kids playing on the seals from Canada that way. So you're saying it would be a Saturday and Sunday, just like a regular Saturday and Sunday, but it would be called a tournament. That's correct. And 
on that Saturday and Sunday, it would be like an 8 to 5 thing or an 8 to 6 thing instead of the weekday 3.30 to 9.30. That's correct. Okay. That's all right. Thanks. So, Tim, with Chris being gone, do you guys have that availability, that information with the uh, with practice? What did I write here? Uh, typical weekdays, practice schedule, typical weekends, game schedule? Yeah, he, that's actually in the Q&A document. Okay. And those answers were provided by Chris Brown. He's the executive director of our youth club. Um, so he's, he's provided that information for you. He's predicting that on Monday through Friday, practices would occur from 4 p.m. to in this part of the two fields. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, games would occur from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Saturday and Sunday? Saturday and Sunday. How many games are played per day? So the reason we're hesitating to answer that question is it depends how old the kids are who we program on the field. So the older kids play a 90-minute match, and there's a halftime break. So we schedule two and a half hours per match um, because you also need them to leave and then invite the next group of kids in. And part of what we're doing is we're going to have a buffer so the overlap doesn't create a parking crowd. We want to make sure that people have the opportunity to leave. We can clean the fields before the next group of people come in for the next game. So there's not an overflow where people are waiting for a parking spot because we don't want them back mm -hmm. up in your neighborhood streets. So with the older kids, um, if you had an eight hour day divided by two and a half hour increments, you know, we have about three different games a day for on two fields. So six games uh, in three increments, right? Two, two games in three increments. Each field is running simultaneously. Correct, correct. That's right. That's right. How many, how many players, on, for how many students are typically? Only 18 okay. are allowed to dress per game. 18 to dress? 18 per team. So you have 36 uh, and 72, right? So you have 36 on one field for home and away, and then the same on the other. And then you generally have one or two coaches, and then you have three referees for each match. Um, and what we so like to do... Seven to dress players home and away on two fields. fields at this no, no, three. Until, 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 that's correct. That's correct. And then the person must have to empty until for, for each of those matches. Yeah, when that game concludes, people leave. And then the next group, is, unless the family happens to have a sibling in the next game, then they stay uh, for that next. And sometimes that happens. A lot of the families have multiple kids playing on it. So it'd be fair to say, on um, two full fields, two games during that two and a half hour period, all the are going to Right. Yeah, so I, I think so. Fans or other family members or whomever has nowhere to park except on the side of the street. Well, the, so the families come with the kids. So, and as a club, we can say, and we have this at Reach 11, where we use our special sports complex, where we say one car per family, um, because there's nowhere, any other park, I mean, this actually has more parking than most other parks per field mm -hmm. that you'll find in town. The 100 spaces for the two fields, that's 50 spaces for, uh, per field, and we compare that to the other parks where we play pretty good. Yes, uh, one question that I just sitting here listening to all this talk of all the activity there at the at the school at least on the school year. Um, and I don't live too far from the Papago Park playing fields, and from where I, where I am, I'm at the, about 66th Street in Vernon, and the playing fields are over across 64th Street and South. Of if I step outside and those are being utilized in the evening, I can hear the noise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really sensitive about noise disease because I just got an Airbnb dump next to me. I'm not. Yeah, not. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, what I'm concerned about, uh, this would not necessarily affect me because I'm far enough away from the school, 
But if you have neighbors around the perimeter of that school who are used to a nice, quiet backyard, they may be in for a surprise. What has been, I mean, because you know, somebody scores and it's yay, yeah. and, uh, and there's going to be noise associated with the kids. The kids make noise, I mean, there's no way around it. There's going to be noise associated with the kids practicing, noise associated with the kids playing, you know, people knowing about. What has been, I have not heard a word, and I, I, I let me just back up a second. I don't think this is necessarily a bad proposal, I think it's a good one. The one thing I've not heard a word about. And uh, I would hate for people to find out after this thing is up and running. And what have you done to address? What if anything have you done to address the issue of noise? Because that's going to be a, that's going to be an issue. Yeah, we, we talked considerably about that at the last. I meeting. was not here at the last. It's meeting. okay. It's all right. No, so I'll, I'll just briefly. Okay. Here. Um, one of the things that's different about soccer versus other parks is we don't use a public address system. Okay. So there's no PA systems. I'm. Next up, there's none of that going on. It's just it's just the same volume you hear if kids are playing in a backyard. You just have a lot more kids because it's a much bigger backyard, right? Um, so it, it's like a family party in a backyard that you have a lot of people there. So um, soccer prohibits any announcements throughout the game. Okay, so, if I can just stop you right yeah. there. I, the noise I hear, for example, from the Dow Road Sports Complex. I don't hear something from the white club. I hear people out there cheering and, right. mm -hmm. and yelling, and which what I mean that's fine. That's what people do at sporting sure. events. But uh, I and again, I wish I'd been here at the last meeting. It wasn't possible for me to be here that evening. But I'm just curious. I, I have not again. I I myself have not heard much about this. What have you done to address just the generic noise, not the PA noise? Sure. Just the generic noise that comes from these things. Yeah. We have not incorporated noise mitigation okay. into okay. the design of the complex at okay. this time. Because that's something that I think the community should or probably will be asking about. And if I were in your position, I would want to have an answer to this. Yeah, that's the honest answer. Well, I know, I understand that. Yeah. But I think people who live in that perimeter around the schoolyard, when they find out that they're nice, quiet backyard, they're going to be very quiet anymore. I don't think they're going to be too happy. Well, yes. oh, if I may, you know, sure. That that used to be a school. Yeah. Used to have a lot more than seventy-two kids. I know. I went there, and so it wasn't <laughs> super, so it wasn't super quiet. But I was it was super quiet. I, I tell you right now, it was super Every quiet weekend. night on the weekend. Well, yeah. Okay, I so left around there so, for sixty years. If I may, sir. Sure. Okay. I'm a soccer coach. Okay. I can tell you during practice, you're not going to hear all the cheering. You're not going to hear. All the loud moves. I can I can okay. see that because I coach. Okay. You don't. You, I don't allow my boys to be yelling in the middle of practice. Okay. And if they do that, they can't heal me. Okay. Games, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's you know, that's family is there. You're fine. But the games are morning to five p.m. And on the weekends. On the weekends. And that's one of the things we addressed. At probably one of the first meetings is that this site. Having grown up there, gone to school, everybody knows it's 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 loud, noisy in the morning. You got breaks and stuff like that. There. But that site has been quiet for the last it's six and seven years. Since 2016, right? And so it's, it's just been sitting there, and we've all been accustomed to this. So even if even if we brought the school back in, let the school noise take over, we'd be like, oh my god! Well, oh, it's actually, I, I tell you right now, it's actually even when the school was there, it was. I didn't hear much noise from Tom. Right. right. I, I'm sorry. I just I did. Well, and every oh, weekend was pretty much quiet. Yeah. Right. True. But I'm just saying that we've we had a period of time now that we've been accustomed to a very quiet, for sure, neighborhood with no traffic. You drive by this morning, there's nothing yeah. going on. But to gear it back up again, it's going to seem like we're going to have more. But I think, but the you know, rising is saying. Yeah. I, I used to coach various YSL. That's a new soccer. Yeah. And we. Used to Mm -hmm. No more empty on weekends. Just on Saturday, and, right. and yeah, you're right. It's only Saturday. I remember that. Yeah. And it was during the day. And it was only during the day. And it was. And I think you were done by like what one or something. You guys started really early. Yeah. So the, see what you, the difference is nothing. We used to have more than seventy-two players there. Um, 
Let's move along. Um, I know rising is made note of that. Okay. Uh, from a district standpoint, we typically, whether we're using a buffer of a parking lot, um, trees, plants, different things help with noise. Um, so that'll be a conversation during design um, that we Okay, I just want to make sure that it come up at some point. Yeah, absolutely. A, a wall around the field. Yeah, yeah. 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 One last uh, item. I, I really appreciate that you're hearing the question. Um, we want to make sure the neighbors are really pleased with us uh, once once this is done. Um, the architecture firm working for us is Gould Evans, uh, and they're amazing. They've done a lot of projects in Scottsdale. They just did all the work in at ASU. They did the whole remodel of Sun Devil Stadium. Um, my guess is if, if Krista Shepard were here, she probably would have a much better answer okay. to your question. Okay. Um, but I wanted to be honest. What I don't know, I'd like to tell you, and we'll, we'll go get the right answer okay. and, and instead of me guessing and it not being. Okay, that's fine. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up is uh, community partnerships. And what is it that Phoenix Rising? Um, will be doing with, in partnership with Scottsdale School, in partnership with the community youth. Um, that's kind of a big deal. We're going to have this wonderful facility, and we certainly want the community to to benefit from it, from Scottsdale Schools to benefit from it in some way. So, uh, Tim, can you talk about what programs, uh, what offerings you, you might have? Uh, whether it's on a monthly basis, a weekly basis. I know we talked a little bit about the community room and having access to that, but I think we're in schools, and the most important thing in our schools is our kids. And so we've got a fantastic uh, little soccer program right over there at Coronado High School. Um, so what is it that beyond this capital improvement to the facility is Rising going to offer uh, to Scottsdale schools, its students, and um, and the community kids. We we have a, a wonderful recreational soccer program. That's our entry level soccer program. Uh, kids begin playing in our recreational soccer program at age three, and some of them become competitive players and get into our elite programs where they're playing much more and they start traveling around the state and even around the country. Other kids, even as they get older, stay in recreational soccer because they really don't want it to be that competitive. They just want to have fun and get out a couple nights a week and play. The recreational program has volunteer coaches, where our competitive program has paid professional coaches. The volunteer coaches come from the communities surrounding the field. One of the things we'd really like to do is serve better this part of Scottsdale. Because we haven't had fields, to program in this area, we're not covering the recreational soccer needs of this area as well. There are other clubs who may be working in this area, but what we'd like to do is to work with Jose and his program and identify through the elementary schools key contacts who might be PE teachers and they might know parents who've been very interested in helping their kids. And generally what we find are moms and dads or uncles who play soccer themselves and really would like to help the young kids. They come in and we put them through a training program uh, and they do it with other volunteers. We get them certified to serve as a volunteer with kids from a safety protocol. And then they go out and they volunteer and they coach these kids several practices uh, a week and then on the weekend they have, they have a game. And we do both a fall and a spring recreational soccer season. The beauty is because it's so volunteer oriented the cost per child is 80 or 90 dollars for an entire season. So the ability for people to participate is one of the most affordable sports programs uh, there is available. Um, so we'd love to program that here and make sure a certain portion of the fields are being used for that purpose, number one. And then number two, we'd like as people are graduating into the competitive programs, having the competitive teams 
training here as well. The competitive teams are older kids, so they can train a little bit later than the younger kids. They like to get the younger kids in so they can get home and eat and, and have time to do their homework and get the better and the, and the kids who are a little bit older. So from a soccer perspective, we're already very well organized to provide that service to this local community. Just need a little bit of help meeting some people so we can round up the volunteers and uh, excite the parents about having their kids get involved. That would be number one. We'd like to work with you during the design phase to determine what else would the neighborhood like us to do on the facilities. We have ideas, but you may not like our ideas. One of our ideas is to have open field days. And there'd be certain days every month where we'd have an open field where people from the neighborhood could come out. They, we could, and we could even arrange games to make it where we play Frisbee soccer, we can play soccer golf, um, or people can just picnic and, and have fun together uh, on the fields and use it as a park on that day. Um, so that's that's one idea we, we have for the property that's not necessarily tied to what Phoenix Rising normally does. But we're open to, you know, we know Amber had a really interesting proposal to do gardening work. And we talked about programming some of those plant selections around the perimeter. And there could be, if, if she chooses to do that and the neighborhood supports that, there could be things we do with the rest of the park where there could be planting days, there could be educational days about uh, about horticulture and, and seed choices and things people can learn playing there and discover as they grow and harvest uh, for their kitchens that they may want to then do at their own home gardens as well. So we're very open and we enjoy it. It gives us a chance to learn as well. A great part of our programming for the kids is nutrition. We believe that the kids have enough fitness and they're learning about nutrition, they have a chance of doing better in school. And one of the things we take great pride in is many of our players end up going to community college and college, and they're the first to receive that level of higher education in the history of the family. And it's because when they're in fifth and sixth grade and they start entering our competitive platform, we talk to the parents and have them learn about prerequisites and how the kind of decisions you're making at home now for the studies are going to happen in middle school will really affect the way your son or daughter is preparing to have an opportunity. They may be wonderful at soccer and we're going to give them that edge, but if they don't have the prerequisites because no one ever talked to the family, they may not be able to, to explore that, that opportunity that soccer could have paid for. A lot of our kids have the opportunity to go to school on scholarship. So that's something we hope to bring to the community as well. That's a longer process. Our youth program has been operating since the early 1980s. So we have a track record. We're actually one of the, the few clubs in the state. We have a full-time employee. His name is Tibor Pella. Uh, he was a coach at UCLA, and he is a full-time manager of our college placement program. And when kids become of the right age, he sits with every parent and every kid. He talks about all the coaches. He talks about resumes. He, he looks at GPAs. If kids aren't studying enough, he gets on their case about it, and he helps them. Uh, and in fact, you'll those of you who can come to some of our matches will see we have a day in May at one of our home games in our stadium where all the kids who are graduating this year are coming onto the field at halftime. We're announcing their names and the colleges where they're going to play soccer. And we're so proud we are able to help them get into college as a part of going through the program. Tim, I think that one thing that gets young kids more excited than anything is meeting a professional player. Is there opportunities that that will circulate our schools and maybe make a day to come to to uh, Kyalia here and, and have a field day with a couple of the players uh, or with your coaches? You know, I think that's one of the things that so many kids look forward to that. That's what gets them to the point where they want to go play soccer is just that ooh ah of, of a professional soccer player. What what might that look like? Yes, and it's something we're, we're really trying to improve as an organization. Uh, we some of you who attended our first meeting pointed out something we should have done better. And that was if we had done the homework to know that Jose was a coach in the community and had a chance to meet his players. And it was something we just didn't do well. And as a new organization, we realized we need to do better with our outreach. 
So as a result, we're working to do that now. We can come to the kids, but we can also host field trips for the kids. And we want to do that not only here in Coronado and with other schools in the area, and bringing, it's easier for us when we have two fields here to be able to tell players that they need to come out. You know, versus saying, hey, we want you to go to one of the parks because we can control what's happening. So um, we, we think that's something that uh, we can add to the community. It's something we can actually track and quantify and report on how often we provided interactions for the kids. And it brings a lot of joy to our players. You know, if you're a 23 year old professional soccer player and kids are all excited to beat you, it really makes you feel good about what you're doing too. So I, I think it, it benefits the, the morale of our organization as well. You know, I think the thing that would be really cool is if you guys do have the fields is because we have, yeah, we have my program, yes, but Solaro has a great program too. Chaparral has a great program. It would be awesome to have you guys throw, you know, just once a year during the season, right beginning of high school season, throw a clinic where you invite at least the juniors and seniors to come out and talk to them. Because they, there's things that they don't understand. You know, like you were talking about expectations and all that stuff. You know, I can't speak for Solaro and Chaparral, but a lot of my kids never thought about college. Definitely, they're seniors, and I'm talking to them all. Have you thought? Have you thought about? You know, this is my first year there, so have you thought about college? And they're like, uh, no. You talk to anybody? No. Coach, can you help me? Well, yeah, I can help you, but it's a little late. Mm -hmm. And then things like grades. Like I have a player that's just fantastic. Like he was my region player of the year, defensive player of the year for the region, but his grades were crap last year. So his GPA is not great, but this year he's got a 3.8 GPA. So he picked it up, and he became a leader in my team. And it's like, I'd love for him to have heard from a player who did it, you know, who played college, who went to the pros, what it takes. Because at that, at that point, I remember getting to that point. It's like suddenly you get there, everybody there is used to being the best player on the team. It's not enough to be gifted. You gotta put in the hard work, you gotta put, but by the time you get there, it's too late. You gotta prepare, you gotta get ready. So I'd love to have you guys, you know, your coach, and a couple of your players. I mean, it would take a lot. Just bring them in, run them through a couple of drills, talk to them about uh, what we talk about this. Yeah, talk we, to them about, about you know what they should be eating, how they should be treating their bodies, how they should be taking care of themselves, stretching. That's another thing. Young kids don't know how to stretch. And body can attest to this as a player. You don't when you're young, you don't need to stretch, so you don't even think about it. But as you're getting older, yeah. all the damage you do to your body because you didn't stretch. Things like that would be fantastic because I think they would they would listen to you more to the players more. One because they're younger, closer to their age, and two because they've gone through the higher step level. And it would cost you guys nothing, really. Yeah, it, I, I love the idea. Many of our players are college graduates. We have one particular player right now who I think could be very inspirational. Uh, John Vaccaro graduated from Wake Forest University and was the number one ranked collegiate player in the United States that year. He was captain of Wake Forest, and this is his third year playing for Phoenix Rising. He's uh, an incredible human being. His father is the first assistant head coach at FC Barcelona in, in Spain. Um, so really, a, you know, just the heritage around the family, the kids would be in awe, and he would talk to them about why did he get his college degree first. Yes, Amber. Um, so I don't think anyone in this room is going to ever fight you on the fact that soccer is good for children. <laughs> you, you're, you, you already sold us the minute it's physical exercise for children, everyone in this room agrees. Um, I think I have a concern because you brought up my uh, not thought that I just have to address you. I think it's really great you're being inclusive, but before you promise anything and say you want us in the space, your space has never incorporated that. So if you want to set aside a meeting with me and we can discuss that, that would be great. I'm open for it, but I would appreciate if you don't promise something that you don't technically have a plan for your organization or a plan for the space. Because then the neighborhood might be disappointed or might have false expectations. Uh, but again, I'll work with you if you absolutely want to. Two, uh, you're talking about having it at the Toronto Media Campus, and if you go through and you have it there, there isn't a bus route with the SUSD. And one of the benefits of the partnering with the SUSD is that you would function together. And so I'm not hearing how, I'm hearing how you would go to events and have raw, raw soccer is great, but how are you bringing the kids in? 
one of the ways you could function more efficiently is by having SUSD have an after-school bus route picking up the students and then bringing them up the campus. Amber, we can't even get that for, I can't even get that for my kids mm -hmm. at Coronado. I'm sorry, that must be really disappointing. It is very disappointing, but I can't even get that. How do you think you're going to get it for them? Well, if they're saying that Phoenix Rising and the SUSD is a good partnership, and then the community is saying we're worried about parking and noise and people on our street, it seems like that's an efficient solution. Yeah, we so pick them up from transportation Phoenix. right now. No, after school. After school. Transportation right, okay. right now because of COVID, because of a lot of different things. Most bus drivers are uh, plus 55. So we've had a lot that just haven't come back to, to drive buses. Um, but I think as we move along, that's certainly not a bad idea. And I think it will improve because I know it was difficult getting the buses to those after school programs. I don't think they were able to, to service any of the middle school track and field or any of that because they just don't have enough bus drivers. By the time they get finished with their routes, um, at that dismissal, they, they don't have time to get back out to the to the school. But I know that in time that will really improve. But for um, clubs, that's not going to work because club soccer are right. neighborhood based. I, I think you're talking more like an after school program or something like that. I, what I would like to see um, at some point is what for Phoenix Rising, what that grassroots effort is because. Jose's right. You don't talk to a kid that's a senior or a junior about college. It's too late. If they haven't had A's since their freshman year, chances are the college isn't looking at it. So you know, I would like to see that Rising has a commitment to Scottsdale schools and this Scottsdale community that, that you're working with these kids in, in sixth grade and seventh grade and getting them to understand how important it is. It's one thing to be a part of the program, uh, to be a part of Phoenix Rising's youth program, but it's also just good for the kids that may not even like sports, but to know that, hey, I made it because I applied myself from the very beginning. The first day of freshman year, I was taking care of business and making my way through. So I think that younger group, that younger set, whether they're part of the youth program or not, uh, Phoenix Rising's players, coaches, uh, whether they're, they're the um, professional coaches or the youth coaches, will have an impact on those kids to, oh wow, you know, that, that coach told me that I need to do this. And they're getting that same echo at home, so they must be right, and, and therefore I will apply myself. If, if it's five kids out of a hundred, better than nothing, right? So we need to, it's 20 till, we're a little bit past now. Um, what I would like everyone to do, and I'll give you just a second, Edmund, um, is on this particular subject, what that commitment to rising and, and Scottsdale is, is for you folks that have the email, is to share some ideas on what that might look like. Um, when, when I had my soccer program in the West Valley, we did two, two times a year, we just did a skills thing. And it was fun and it had prizes and we barbecued at the end and it was awesome. And everybody went home and talked about it for weeks because all the kids got a chance to touch the soccer ball, talk to the coaches, um, have fun with their friends, all of that. And with a facility like this, man, that could be a carnival extraordinaire. So, you know, those are the kinds of ideas that, that I think Rising, maybe new at this part of it, need to hear, need to know that, hey, we're really interested. If you're going to be here in our community, you got to be more than a soccer field to us. You got you to gotta be able to outreach to our schools. You got to be able to outreach to our kids. Heck, maybe they get a men's league going. Especially if you're renting from the district. Yeah. So I would like for you guys to, Alice Sipos, everybody has her contact information, shoot her some information on things that we can talk to rising about. Okay. So, Ed, sorry, didn't want to forget you. No, <clears throat> I actually wanted to wait till the end because this is the thing I think most people don't realize. 
Nancy and I and other community members like Jose have been involved with what happened to Tom OEF since it started. I mean, I know myself and Nancy and a few other community members were there to the very bitter end before they closed the school. Trying hard not to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now the whole thing which seems to bother me when people start, saying, well, I want this or I want that or we're going to do this community thing. And then it, it's sort of ironic that, you know, Mr. Raylor's talking about, yeah, you know, the rising needs to interact with the community. Do you realize for all these years, the district has done nothing except prepare a minimum? Mm -hmm. So if the community says, you know what, rising, we need to think about something else, I can tell you right now that. You know, board member Libby Hartwell's over there, and anyone who's listening in, and Mr. Raylor can tell you this right now. If we don't choose rising, the district has zero dollars to deal with that building. So if you think there's too much noise, how much fun do you think it's going to be if we have more coyotes and homeless people there because the district can't do anything to the property? Because while there's a lot of those things like rising needs to do a lot, sadly, our district has done so very little and there's been changes and everyone has so many excuses, believe me. If I were to print out the number of emails I've sent to the district over the years, it'd be longer than rising's entire design plan, probably for the entire globe. So we need to carefully consider what we want to do, because if we want to go on and some of someone's idea of like, hey, we need to do this, we need to do this. There was a time for that a long time ago, but no one else came up for it. And I personally am sort of really insulted. A lot of people are now coming up with sort of like Johnny come lightly. And I understand it's very difficult to communicate. But Rising has done a tremendous effort to try to do something, but no one else has throughout the years. So what really the district needs to do now, and you know, this is to save rising some time. If rising doesn't approve, what will the district do? Because you need to realize the history of the district maintaining that facility is absolutely abysmal. So if we want to continue to be it's quiet and abysmal property, well great. Then the community needs to get together and say, you know what, we want to have blighted property because we know the district's not going to fund this. And I'm sorry for the sanctions over there. You guys cannot invest this amount of money to redo the property. That's an allegation. So, you don't know that off the top of your head. No, actually, I do. This is the whole thing. I have spent more time invested into that school and what he's teaching than most other people. And no one else has spent the time to say, look, this is what needs to happen. A lot of people say we want a school. Most people don't know about the enrollment issues. Oh, we want to do this. The district doesn't have money for this. If the district is being very obtuse and not being clear, I'm sorry, that's the way our school district works. At this point, Phoenix Rising has been more open and more communicative than the district has. And actually, Mr. Raylor admitted during one of the first meetings that he's a poor communicator. That's because his job is not communication. If SUSD ever has a communications department which functions, it'll be a miracle, but that's a different subject. The thing is, we need to realize as a community, can we accept this proposal? If we do not, then I believe Mr. Rail or some of our district needs to clearly stand up and say, you know what, guys, you're going to continue to be blighted. We can try to do these things, but we don't have the money. So unless an angel investor appears, we need to think about that. There always needs to be a negative when you think about it. We can ask a lot from rising, but as it is now, no one's asked anything for the district. I can guarantee you, Superintendent Menzel is not going to call a board meeting to dig through a budget which they're already short on to try to do something for Tom Alia and our community. Because if you look at the news, we've not been cared for, we've been ignored and abused. So I think it's time for people to just take a moment, realize what this opportunity is, they realize what the negative is. And until we do that, this is all a lot of hot air. Because I'm telling you, after seven years, I have heard it all. So I want people to really be honest with themselves. Thank you. All right. Is the condition of the tunnel as it sits considered blighted in your, in your view? 
in my view? Yeah. Yes. Actually, I've spoken to uh, several law firms. The community members can band together to actually form a legal action against the district for, in, you know, degrading their property values. Unfortunately, because of the hyper growth of the area around us, it'd be a difficult case. But as more things go up and our property values go up, not having a school and having a blighted field and a boarded up building, which I'm sorry is absolutely horrendous to have, is a problem. And I hate to say it, our board members don't live around here. Right. And most of the people who work in the district don't live around here. Right. So, yeah, correct, no. I, I know they don't. But the thing is, if Phoenix Rising comes and spends whatever amount of money, and then they say, you know what, you guys are just horrible people, we're going to go build and, you know, somewhere else, we're going to be left with buildings, so we're going to have something. And that will give something for Mr. Raylor or his replacement to say, okay, Rising was there for two years, we have these buildings, we could rent them out, we need to do something. But as it is now, the district's doing nothing, and it can't because it doesn't have money. He spoke about, you know, Kiva. You realize we voted for a bond to rebuild schools, but Tom Leah, you know what the money was for? To tear it down. That's it. So if we all assume the district's going to come to us on bed and say, we're sorry, community, we really opposed you guys, but we're going to improve it. No, it's not going to happen. Yes, Nancy. Well, the other part of that is to, if someone who is willing to invest in the property isn't found in the school district, can't do anything with the fee if they can't afford it. Uh, so. They'll sell it. And there is a movement right now building in the north that all of our schools that have declined enrollments need to be looked at for combining enrollments and closing down schools and selling them off. And I can just forget the developers are out there panting. Yep. And that's scary. We don't need, this is just me speaking, this is, I don't want to see these neighborhoods destroyed by high density right in the middle of the neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in the district's defense, <laughs> the property is not a school. There's no children going to that school. So it is very difficult to spend capital dollars on that property. We cut the grass. Once the flood irrigation schedule starts, we'll start flood irrigating. The grass will be green again. We take care of the weeds. The, everything is the buildings boarded up. I'll give you that, Edmund. Um, short of remodeling it, there's nothing else that we could do for that. Um, December 2019 was the first meeting between the city of Scottsdale. Phoenix Rising and the district. And I know that there were conversations even before that. I would like nothing more than to turn that facility into something that the community can enjoy. We've worked for however many meetings to get everybody on the same page to say that we think that this is something we could do. We've had our input, we've asked our questions. I would like nothing more then to go to the next step, have that community meeting, get that community input. We'll send out flyers, we'll Twitter and Uber and do whatever we need to do to get the word out so that we can talk to the community as a whole, share with them the work that this group has done. And they can tell us, yes, we're going to move forward. Every detail cannot possibly be worked out here and now or in two weeks or 10 weeks. Or it takes time to work out all those details. But generally speaking, this proposal and the efforts that Rising has uh, put in, is this something that we can say to our community in a community meeting, hey, we'd like to, we'd like to press forward on this? I, for one, would say that. I think this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, there's some questions, but I think this is a basically a sound proposal. There are going to be there are going to be ruts in the road as we move forward. Is that just the way life is? 
but uh, this is what's on the table. I agree with you, that's a blighted property. I've also been concerned about the possibility of the district selling it. And my concern about it being sold is we will wind up with something like what we've seen out on McDowell Road, four and five stories, uh, right smack in the middle of our neighborhood, maybe six or seven stories. So let me address that too. The sale of the property since Denise Birdwell, the name that should not be spoken, <laughs> has never, there's never been mention of selling that property. Okay. But I, I, it's, it's a complex process to sure. sell a school sure. property. Sure. So that's complex. There, there's not, that's not the easy answer. And from day one, we've heard, we know that you want that to remain a property where kids can enjoy the property. I guess what I was trying to say is I think this is a sound proposal and I haven't heard anything else uh, that really impresses me very much. And, and I understand that there's a complex process to selling school property, but I also know that's a very valuable piece of property and I can't imagine it's going to sit right smack in the middle of one of the hottest real estate markets in the United States without you know, it's we, not just going to sit there. That's we get calls bad. all the time. I'll bet you Brokers do. call us all the time. I'll they all send them to me, and the answer is no. Because I've been told from up above for a very long time, the answer is no. We are not selling that property. Okay. I, I, anyway, my, that, I've said all I'm going to say. I think this is a, I think this is something I would feel comfortable with going to my neighbors and saying, the basic concept is a good idea. Thank you. Something as a community, uh, it will make a good community center for us. It will be a, something that's alive now, a property that's just very valuable. But dead. Thank you. Yes, Nancy. As long as you've been here, it's not been discussed to sell this property. Four and a half years. Prior to four superintendents. Four, yes. four CFOs. Have we talked about before? Yes. And they were making a deal with uh, certain people in the state legislature to make it easy to do. Yeah. So it's not impossible. It's just not. And like the gentleman just said, this is a sound project. But I looked at Amber's project and I don't want to discourage her. This is a project that could, could be easily fit even Yavapai because it's up. We're looking to close it. I would like to see that somewhere. Is this, is Old Tunnel near the right spot? I don't know. I've been working on that property since they told the community that it was unsafe for habitation and uh, we got to close it, which was a big lie. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir of these 80 fields you guys are, have access to, um, is there one or two or several that are that kind of mimic our specific situation, you know, the schools interior to the neighborhoods? It's, you know, everyone's coming in that lives here, kind of goes through there. So my reason is, is there a place where we could, or I could go to, to see what, what is in action? Something where there's games being played and see what kind of traffic patterns. And residential. Yeah. Yeah. Your first and only residential property. Do you have other residential? Well, we, for us, no. But for the park system, the first one that comes to my mind is Mountain View Park mm -hmm. on Mountain View Road. Mm -hmm. um, it's completely surrounded by on on two sides anyway. With um, it has uh, what's the name of the school there? Cheese yeah. on the one side, and then it has. Homes all along the soccer fields, mm -hmm. um, and those fields aren't nearly as nice as what we're going to be building. Mm -hmm. And the lights there are really old, mm -hmm. so they spill a lot more than ours. Um, how, many, how many fields? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why it's a, that's why I was just thinking of that one. It's kind of, and the there's two soccer fields, and then one of the soccer fields sort of blends into a baseball monument, which mm -hmm. we it will be smaller than that footprint, but they have one community building. It's a little bigger than this one. Uh, with bathrooms and, and like a community room, 
and then those two soccer fields, and then there's a basketball court and stuff that we won't have the space for. Right. But it, it, it kind of gives you a good idea, I think. And they would call the same schedule as what's proposed for yeah. Connelly. Yeah. Same exact. Very similar. Yeah, my kids grew up playing there. Right. Yeah. yeah there's a, another comment that I just wanted to share because we talked about this in a previous meeting. And you, you, we, we didn't have a chance for you to meet him, but um, the, the gentleman who runs the recreational program I was talking about, mm -hmm. Neil Graham, lives in the Tonalia in the Tonalia neighborhood. So he and he's been with us a long time. He lives among you, um, owns a home there, and and so he would actually be working there every. I mean, he, he loves that because he can walk to work. Um, but so we do we do have a key member of our management who would be responsible for the success of the project who owns a home in the neighborhood. Just to share. Yeah. Yes. Um, in, in light of community interest, um, I really appreciate the comments that were said earlier. But I think that it's important, as I spoke of in the very beginning, to make sure that the community is aware of even just proposals for the space. And I do recognize that Phoenix Rising is willing to in, invest in that space, and that's really wonderful. And if they go through with it, I trust that they would listen to the community. But since we're still in the development phase, it feels a little bit undemocratic just to say, well, we got one proposal that's the only one we're listening to, and that's the only one we either get a yes and no on before we listen to something else. And so, Dennis, I recognize you're saying you don't want to have a meeting where there's some people from one party and some people from another party because that would get really infighty. That's why I'm asking if we could have a proposal meeting for the other proposal and then get a yes no on that and then that would be a moot issue and everyone in the community would know okay there's one sound proposal now but as it speaks it's not truthful to say that there's only one proposal when there are two proposals at large and the second proposal hasn't even gotten an opportunity to be spoken about or to be talked about in the community it hasn't it has not. You guys haven't been talking to me with a There, there has not people. been a community meeting for. But you, the problem staff. is you're asking the wrong person. Then it is the decision maker. He told Who you would you suggest I, to someone I will teacher? talk to Dr. Manzel. I'll be with him tomorrow. Okay. And, um, but I, can, I can tell you again, I said it once before tonight. My direction has been follow the rising process through to its end. And then, so we can't have two competing. Why not? Because Why Rising has been dialogue? doing this for months, almost years. So I will talk to Dr. Menzel again. We will we will make some final determination. So it's either it's going to be considered or it's not going to be considered. Well, I don't think the idea deserves to just get scrapped, but the community deserves to hear another idea and then decide, okay, maybe okay, I will Okay, can we be straight up here? Say that again. How much money do you have? Well, this isn't their meeting, so this isn't an appropriate No, no, I, it's, it's a fair question. Yeah. To go along with what you're saying, it's a fair question. They're bringing in a couple million dollars. They're making it the for 20 years. What do you bring to the table? Hang on, hang on. Let me say Yes. So I know I'm not part of your vision committee. I didn't know anything about your original committee until recently. I'm a relatively new board member. Um, you do have a board member on your vision committee, and I hope she's not here. She's living in the ether at the moment. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a moment and try to get this back on track. So that what Dennis is referring to is a good faith negotiation. The last board meeting that we had, and I spoke with Pam about this, and I wanted to be clear as to what we voted on. So the board voted at the last board meeting in an executive session, which Dennis alluded to, which was with our attorney. The attorneys have been in a good faith negotiation for some months with Phoenix Rising. It is slow. Typically, these are protracted discussions. And there is a legal definition of a good faith negotiation. And you can't just walk away from those without some consequence. So we are continuing down that path, and that's why we don't have a competitive proposal scenario right now. Okay, negotiations fall apart and negotiations succeed. So we're in a negotiation as a district with being ready. So that's why that's the answer to your question. 
is that's why there's not proposal discussion happening whenever you first approach the district at that time and that was months ago so we're at the stage we are and then we have a legal standard to execute on that legal standard and that's a good faith negotiation with the nation. they are also at the table in good faith so unless somebody acts in bad faith which us considering another proposal would be bad faith that was the decision by the board to continue in good faith and see where this goes and that's what mr Raylor has been doing. okay it isn't because it's not a great proposal and it's not because of money or lack thereof it's because we're already engaged in good faith negotiation with the next resident Thank you. I hope that clarifies. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, just as a follow up? Do you know if there ever was a public announcement to the community that they were having a negotiation, or if there was ever a set date? Suppose I'm going to make up a fake date right now. They said, okay, January 1st, we've got a proposal, but we haven't done this good faith. Could a proposal come forward before my fake date of January 1st? And was there any public announcement of that? So. Um, I'm going to answer based on what I know, Perfect. which That's is fine. probably not the whole history of what everybody else in this room might know. That is, this wasn't a discrete process of step one, step two, step three. It kind of organically came about and then built up momentum. And as Mr. Rayo referred to, it was start and stop over the course of over what, 18 months for various reasons. Losing interest, one side, the other one not deciding not whether they want to really have this discussion or not, transition in the administration at the district, mm -hmm. a pandemic. So lots of things have gotten in the way to make this kind of stop and start. So there, it really kind of was a continuum as I understand it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. We've been at the table the whole time. I have not. Um, it's been more of a continuum and it's not really been this, you know, press go, uh, you know, on January 1. It wasn't like that. So the answer to your question, I don't believe anything like that happened because I don't think anyone really understood this or was really going to get enough momentum to enter into this good faith negotiation phase, which is where we're at now. Right. Okay. That makes sense. No, I appreciate that. And I think the only uh, the thing that the SNAP committee is feeling a little bit disgruntled about is that they had communication with the district in 2020 and they had communication with Mr. Roller, is that about this space? And they were, for lack of a better 21st century term, term ghosted. You know, they, they would get calls that were dropped. They would get voicemails. They have documented evidence of over 11 different calls in a week that were placed to SUSD that were never returned about the space. So it just feels a little ignorant to say there was one proposal. But I appreciate you explaining that and it does help me understand and illuminate the point better. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is the that's the facts of where we're at. Um, I did not know about the previous and, and again, there have been a lot of moving parts for it. And I'm, I'm sorry you've had that experience. Um, I um, at this point, unfortunately, is where we're at in terms of your review of your proposal. But um, I wanted to just clarify it because I don't, I was sensing the tie of care was going in a non constructive way. And I think we're all here for the betterment of the community. I'm going to stay on that path. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And I hope that your biggest takeaway from this meeting was how deeply invested this community is in this property. And I just want to thank you for coming and hope that this meeting translates in the fact that Phoenix Rising because you're choosing the complicated process of investing in a non-commercial asset because you're in a residential area that will mean that you have to work with the community in ways that you have agreed to and in ways that might be much i hope that in some kind of actual like physical contact that we can see that there's going to be community work with the interest, whether that means that you always have a community member on the board for that property because that would ensure that the property was used in the right way no matter what you always find some kind of agreement to work with the community because you're in a residential area thank you yeah i think you're right and i think those are good ideas and um we are dependent on the community our entire business structure 
on ongoing community support, and we recognize we need to earn that. And when we do something wrong, we'll be honest and tell you. When we don't know, we'll be honest and tell you. And when we do something right, we hope we can all celebrate together. Yeah. Okay. So, would I, be, would I be overstepping if I said that it's time for a community meeting? That no. this visioning committee is satisfied with the proposal and ready to take it to the next level? Yes. Could we submit questions and then Phoenix Rising will answer and then we will you'll agree to a community meeting? And what was the date you would like the next community meeting, which is different than this? So there's some logistics that happen to have that community meeting. We need to work with Rising, get flyers done, get them mailed out, uh, do the communication package. So. I'll need a few days to determine when that meeting will be. Uh, usually no less than two weeks of advance notice. So we could be looking at the uh, very much the end of April and probably the first week of May. If we're giving people proper advance notice, making sure that Rising has all their ducks in a row to, to pitch this to the community, um, it's going to take two or three weeks to put that together. So as usual, yes, submit your questions. We will get those questions answered. Um, ha has anybody been to our website to look at the, the work that's on there? Yes. I, um, I just want to, can you remind everyone to please submit any ideas of collaboration yeah. for our kids that you have? Mm -hmm. I am particularly interested yeah. in what your thoughts on that are. I appreciate you being open. So thank you. Uh, we will get um, meeting notes out Monday afternoon. We will remind on the, the, the homework, if you will, um, and then we'll try and uh, identify the community meeting date. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, we may need to do it at Coronado in the auditorium um, to make sure that we have space for enough people to be there. So, um, but what I'd like to some hands, some nods, some absolutely nots. We're moving forward with this proposal to the community meeting and in hopes of moving forward and finalizing these negotiations. I, I, I have a quick question beforehand, just as like a, a worry about what's going to happen at that meeting. Uh -huh. So this meeting is essentially a very small collective of what the community represents. And you can see even between us, there's conversations about that noise wouldn't bother me. Yes, I'm worried about that noise. And then from Phoenix, Phoenix Rising, it's usually just, oh, OK. So my concern is that by us showing up and saying we support this vision, and them saying this is our proposal for the space that the neighbors will just do exactly what we just did. I'm sorry, I'm worried about the sound. I'm sorry, I'm worried about parking. So what needs to happen instead of just saying there's going to be a community meeting that will just lead to a larger chaotic version of this. Phoenix Rising needs to have a we talked with the visioning community and this is what we agreed to or this is the adjustments we have made in response to this, and you need to have like several slides that say we're going to have the playground open. We want to work with you on sound levels. We have agreed to plant trees along this back area to block the sound. But like you need to actually have those processes in place, or it's just going to continue to be an incredibly chaotic meeting of every neighbor being like, I'm worried about the sound and all of those other things. So, what I'm saying is, before you throw this to a grander group of people, they need to have worked out those things in agreement so that way then the community just goes, oh, OK, and just peppers in a few extra things that we haven't thought of. Yes, the intention would be to format the meeting so that we can basically review all the work that's been done in a short amount of time. All of the questions, the flyer, the, the communication would refer people to the website so they could do a little bit of homework, hopefully before they come to the meeting. But yes, ideally the format would be in a manner that lands on a yes, no answer 
and there's technology that we can use uh, to be able to extract that from people uh, through their cell phones. To have a vote, you mean? To actually have a vote. So we'll work on that. There's that's a lot of work to do, um, but two or three weeks we'll get that assembled, get that going, uh, because it's only going to get worse these conversations <laughs> right that's what i was predicting so we just want to we want to move this thing forward okay so raise the hands community meeting next asap three weeks ish okay. i think you should do it after the end of the month because people are usually at the end of the month okay. Dennis, yes before you send that flyer out do you want to ask some of the people here? Yeah, I, I, will, so. I will do She's one saying. better. I'll send it to the entire vision and command. You guys have been part of the decision process. So you'll see the flyer. That it's okay? important. Because I think the flyer is going to be important as to what information's on it. Exactly. It can't be, hey, come to this meeting. That's not going to work. Oh, We're going to have to have some, some <laughs> places to send people so they can get information in advance. Um, because there really is nothing worse than missing out on the information and coming asking the question that's been asked right. 40 times over. Okay. So Thank you all for clarify, coming. There will be a vote at that community meeting. I will do what I can to make okay. sure that there, because there's no other way to understand how that happens. When we do the, when we do the community meeting with our new builds, okay. yes. it's called menti.com. Mentimeter, you can get on. Teachers probably use it. Yeah, Mentimeter is great. It's awesome. You can have so, a word clouds. And, and we can, we can, yes. So between word clouds and multiple questions, we'll work all that out. We'll get that lined up. Yes. Um, the whole thing is, if any of you remember the Coronado Success Initiative, CSI, we're mirroring that because at that meeting in Sky Song or Sky Diver for the ones called whatever. <laughs> um, we use that. And they asked the people, it's like, okay, what do you think about Coronado that it showed a word cloud? And then people voted on certain things. And I can tell you, since that happened, this community as a whole cannot communicate to save its life. I mean, at this point, if Godzilla showed up and ate Mr. Raylor right now. The news would not be able to report his death because one person would say, I think it was Mothra. Someone else is going to say, you know what, I think that was Stalin coming back. And then someone's going to say, you know what, I was so interested about the garden and the hobos, I didn't even know what happened to the guy. Well, a good thing is if Godzilla ate me, he'd be full. <laughs> yeah. Give us time to run. Yes, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.